Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Amadeo, and I'm the principal of the Amadeo Law Firm. Uh, thanks for joining us today for our webinar, Expanded Government Contracting Opportunities for Joint Ventures. Now, this is uh, part of a series of webinars that we'll be conducting throughout the year on issues that are important to federal government contractors. And again, today's webinar is on federal government contracting opportunities that are available to joint ventures. And I'm excited to be joined today by Jennifer Schaus, who's principal and founder of Jennifer Schaus and Associates, which is a consulting firm that provides marketing and government support services to government contractors. So um, a roadmap for today's webinar is we're going to start first with a brief introduction by Jennifer and me for those who don't know us. Uh, I'll then give a presentation on joint ventures with concluding remarks. Uh, then Jennifer will take over and give a presentation on strategies for marketing to the federal government. Uh, and then she'll offer her conclusions. And then after Jennifer's presentation, uh, we'll turn uh, to any questions that attendees may have. Uh, so before we go on, I just want to touch on some housekeeping matters. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you have space to send us uh, questions. So feel free to send your questions as we go along. Uh, and we'll try to go through as many questions as we can uh, at the end of the webinar. Now, when you send your questions, if you could let us know um, if it's directed at, at a particular presenter, uh, that would be great. Um, and if we don't get to your questions or if questions come up uh, after the webinar is over, we're providing our emails and contact information um, at the end of the webinar. So feel free to send, um, feel free to contact us afterwards. Now, lastly, uh, if you can't stay on the whole time, no worries. Uh, every attendee will get an email with links to the presentation and the recorded webinar. Uh, we're also going to send everyone who signed up um, for the webinar a white paper uh, that the firm published this year that talks about uh, the government procurement rules relating to um, joint ventures. So I'll start with our introductions. Uh, again, I'm Mark Amadeo, and I'm the founding principal of the Amadeo Law Firm, which is a legal boutique with offices in Washington, D.C., and in Maryland. Um, I have over 20 years of experience both as a government attorney and also serving in private practice where I was a partner at a DC firm before starting my own law firm. A little bit about the firm. Uh, the Amadeo law firm has offices at three locations. Uh, the the firm's primary focus is on federal government contracting. Um, and with a national federal practice, the, uh, the firm's clients have come to the firm from all over the country and have been of all sizes, from startups and entrepreneurs uh, to midsize and large Fortune 200 companies. And we help clients with all of their government contracting needs, from cementing relationships through teaming agreements, subcontracting agreements, joint ventures, uh, and to negotiating with contracting officers and assisting with contract modifications and maintaining compliance with FARs, DFARs, and other regulations. Now, as I mentioned, we're lucky to have Jennifer Schaus with us today, and so I'll ask her to say a few words about herself, her firm. Jennifer. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, Happy to be here with everybody. Uh, my business is based in Washington, D.C., and we help uh, companies that wish to do business with the government or who already are conducting business with the government uh, with GSA schedules, proposal writing, uh, 8A certification, contract administration, and other, I'll say, ancillary support services. Uh, we also host many events and conferences 
Our events are typically at the Kennedy Center, and those are held quarterly. We've been doing that for almost 10 years now. Our conferences cover topics in defense contracting, uh, working with the intelligence community, uh, and covering a variety of uh, ongoing issues in the government contracting sector. So I'm flattered and excited to be here with everybody that's joined us. Uh, it looks like a big crowd, and um, happy to be uh, working here with Mark uh, to deliver some good content for you guys. So Mark, I'll give the uh, microphone back to you. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, for folks in the D.C. area who are, or who are visiting, um, if you've not been to one of Jennifer's uh, Kennedy Center networking events, they really are a great opportunity to network and to meet contracting personnel. So uh, if you're in the area, uh, once she holds them, please try to make it. Um, so today we're going to talk about joint ventures. Um, the joint venture structure, in my view, has always provided unique opportunities in government contracting. But in 2016, the US Small Business Administration, which regulates government contracting by small businesses, implemented changes to the, its rules that expands those opportunities significantly. So let's take a step back. When companies come together to sell their goods and services to the federal government, um, those collaborations are called teaming arrangements under the federal acquisition rules. And those federal contracting rules basically recognize two kinds of teaming arrangements or alignments. Now one alignment, uh, and the one that's most prevalent, is the prime contractor, subcontractor teaming arrangement. And this is a vertical relationship where money and contracting orders and authority flows down or trickles down from the prime contractor to the subcontractor. But the federal contracting rules also recognize a second kind of alignment, which is more of a horizontal alignment. And that's when two or more companies form a joint venture and collectively act as prime contractor. And this is the, uh, the kind of arrangement that we're going to focus on today. So the Federal Acquisition Regulation, or FAR, uh, it, cont it contains uh, the regulations for federal government contracting. And it's basically the rule book that federal contractors and federal agencies have to follow when they contract with each other. And as I mentioned before, FAR explicitly recognizes joint ventures. And FAR also recognizes the benefits that inure to the government when companies collaborate in these kinds of teaming arrangements. And these benefits include enabling the government to obtain the best combination of performance, cost, and delivery. But there are also advantages to companies that collaborate in joint ventures at the prime contracting tier. And these benefits include the ability to spread risk and leverage their combined capital and share profits. And on past performance, one of the things that the SBA did in its 2016 rule changes to make joint ventures more attractive and to bolster their chances of successful bidding was to provide clarifying instructions to contracting officers that evaluate bids. Um, the SBA clarified that when contracting officers consider whether the joint venture has past experience or performance, um, they have to consider not only the past performance of the joint venture as a whole, but also the past experience of each of the joint venture partners. So joint venture partners can piggyback off of each other's past performance. And, and the last benefit, which is the one we'll focus on for the rest of my presentation, is an expansion of the contracting opportunities that are available to joint ventures. And what I mean by expansion of opportunities um, are opportunities that are available to joint venture partners that enable them to bid on or perform under contracts that they otherwise would not be able to. So there are generally three ways that joint venture rules expand these opportunities. The first way uh, the joint venture rules expand opportunities is by allowing businesses to come together 
and pool their assets and resources to bid on and perform under a small business contract, even though collectively the businesses exceed the small business size standard for a contract. Now a little bit about uh, size standards. Contracting officers set a size standard or threshold for how big a company can be and yet still be considered a small business for purposes of a contract that's set aside for a small business. So if a company exceeds the small business size standard or threshold for a contract, it's ineligible to perform as a prime contractor on that contract. Well, nevertheless, the joint venture rules allow joint ventures collectively to exceed the small business size standard of a contract. Uh, the second way that joint venture rules expand opportunities is by allowing businesses that are not 8A, women-owned or service-disabled-owned, or that are not hub zone businesses to perform as prime contractors under contracts that are set aside for businesses that do qualify as one of these types of businesses. And the third way uh, the joint venture rules expand opportunities is by allowing large businesses to perform at the prime contracting tier uh, under contracts that are set aside for small businesses. So, as I mentioned, um, one way that opportunities are expanded under the joint venture rules is by allowing business partners to uh, partner to uh, businesses to partner together at the prime tier, even though collectively they exceed the small business size standard. And the way this is possible is through an exception to affiliation that applies to certain joint ventures. So stepping back, um, normally joint venture partners are considered to be what is called affiliated. And that means that the sizes of the partners will be added up together to determine if the joint venture is a small business eligible for a small business contract. So normally if the combined sizes of the joint venture partners exceed the small business size standard for the contract, the contract will be ineligible for a small business contract. Well, there's an exception to this affiliation rule for three kinds of joint ventures. And that is joint ventures made up of small businesses, joint ventures made up of mentors and protégés in the 8A mentor protégé program, and joint ventures made up of mentors and protégés in the SBA's all small mentor protégé program. And essentially, under the exception to affiliation that applies to these three kinds of joint ventures, as long as one member of the joint venture is small, the entire joint venture will be considered a small business. Now we're going to talk about the two mentor-protege joint ventures in just a few minutes. But I want to say a few things about the first category of joint ventures that qualifies for the affiliation exception. And that's joint ventures where all the partners are small businesses. So with these kinds of joint ventures, a small business with a particular expertise or past performance uh, in one area can team up with another small business with past performance in another area and they can in turn team up with the third business with past performance in yet another area. So this ability of a partner to shore up weaknesses in past performance or in expertise uh, without having to staff up and without having to worry about the size standard when pooling resources with other small businesses can be not only useful, it can be very cost effective. And one other thing about this category of joint ventures, the 2016 rule changes liberalize things a bit because before 2016, the affiliation exception for these small business joint ventures only applied to bundled contracts or contracts that exceeded, or, uh, exceeded a certain minimum amount. Well now the affiliation exception applies to the joint, these joint ventures for any small business contract. So before we move on, I just want to touch a little bit more on the affiliation exception for joint ventures. For the affiliation exception to apply to the three categories of joint ventures, uh, the joint ventures have to meet certain prerequisites. The first, is that the joint venture must be identifiable as a joint venture and it has to do business under its own name. 
So if the joint venture does business under the name of one of the joint venture parties, the affiliation exception will not apply and the sizes of the businesses will be tallied up to see if the joint venture is small. Second, the joint venture agreement must be in writing. And then a third requirement we'll talk about is a structural prerequisite. So the rules anticipate that a joint venture can be a, a contractual joint venture in which the ventures come together as formal or informal partners. But the rules also allow the joint venture parties to create a separate third legal entity, like an LLC, to contract with the government. And there could be tax reasons for doing this, or the parties may decide administratively it's cleaner to create a separate legal entity, or the parties may want to create um, an additional layer of liability protection. But if the joint venture partners create a separate legal entity, it cannot be populated. In other words, the joint venture entity cannot hire its own employees to perform work under the contract. At most, the legal entity can hire its own employees, but only to perform administrative functions. And then lastly, a joint venture can't be awarded more than three contracts over a two-year period. And if it exceeds that number, the partners will be deemed affiliated. So, as I mentioned earlier, another way uh, the joint venture rules expand opportunities is by allowing businesses that are not 8A or women-owned or service-disabled veteran-owned or, or that are not hub-zone businesses to nevertheless participate at the prime tier for these kinds of small business set-aside contracts. So what are the requirements for a joint venture to perform under one of these socioeconomic set-asides? Well, first, you only need one of the ventures to qualify for the set-aside. So for an 8A contract, you need one 8A business. For a WSB set-aside, you need at least one woman-owned small business. And for an SDVOSB set-aside, you need at least one, at least one service-disabled veteran-owned small business. And for a hub zone set-aside, you need at least one hub zone business. Now, just as an aside, here again, the 2016 rule changes made things a bit easier. Because before that, for a hub zone contract, all of the joint venture partners needed to be hub zone businesses. And for an 8A set aside, you needed an 8A joint venture partner that was really small, um, less than half the size standard of the contract. And the 8A contract itself had to be of a certain minimum amount. Now, a second requirement um, is um, since these are small business set-aside contracts, the joint venture must be either small in the aggregate or it must be one of the three types of joint ventures that are eligible for the exception to affiliation. And then another requirement for a joint venture to qualify for a socioeconomic set-aside contract is that the joint venture agreement needs to have very specific provisions. And, and generally for each of these kinds of set-asides, there are at least 12 specific provisions that have to be written into the joint venture agreement. And lastly, to be eligible to perform under a socioeconomic set-aside contract, the joint venture must meet performance of work requirements. And here, there are really two levels of performance of work requirements. The first level focuses on the minimum amount of work that's performed by the joint venture itself rather than by subcontractors of the joint venture. For example, under a contract for services, the joint venture rules say that the joint venture has to perform at least 50% of the work under the prime contract. The second level of performance uh, work requirement focuses on how the work is divided within the joint venture. In other words, how much of the joint venture work is performed by the qualifying venture. So for an 8A contract, it's how much of the work is being performed by the 8A company. And for a WSB set aside, how much of the work is being done by the WSB and so forth. And then you know, taking a, a contract for services again, the qualifying venture generally must perform at least 40% of the total work that's done by the joint venture partners.
Now, I said another way the rules expand opportunities is by allowing large businesses to perform as prime contractors under contracts that are set aside for small businesses. Now, the joint venture rules allow this when the large business is a mentor of a mentor protege uh, of a mentor protege relationship in the 8A mentor protege program or the all small uh, mentor protege program. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, mentor protege joint ventures are already eligible for the exception to affiliation. And like joint ventures for socio economic set asides, mentor protege joint venture agreements also need to have 12 very specific provisions. Um, and they also have to satisfy uh, two levels of performance of work requirements, like the requirements we talked about uh, for joint ventures that perform under socioeconomic set-asides. So just a little bit more on the all-small mentor protege program, because it is such a significant development. So one of the rule changes that the SBA made in the summer of 2016 created this um, new venture protege program. Um, and this new program is modeled after the existing 8A mentor protege program. Now, under the 8A program, approved mentors provide business development assistance to proteges which are certified under the 8A business development program. And these mentors and proteges can then form joint ventures to bid on and be awarded 8A contracts. And because uh, mentors can be large businesses, uh, before the new all-small program, um, the 8A mentor protege program was uniquely sing was, was really unique. It provided um, one of the few, if only, opportunities for a large business to compete for and be awarded a small business contract. Now, the problem is that these opportunities were limited only to mentor protege relationships uh, with 8A companies only. Well, now, um, under the new all small mentor protege program, large businesses have the opportunity now to collaborate with and mentor any kind of small business and to joint venture with any kind of small business to perform um, at the prime tier under small business set aside contracts. Now, these small business contracts can include WSB, HubZone, and SDVOSB set asides. Um, as long as the protege qualifies as a WOSB or HUBZone or SDVOSB. So the federal contracting universe has been expanded dramatically for large businesses that are looking to mentor small businesses. Um, if you want more information about the new All Small program, we, uh, we have a, a short video uh, on the firm's uh, video blog page. And that blog page also contains a link to a presentation where we talk a bit more about the mentor proje program and the application process. Now, um, I've mentioned before that joint venture agreements um, for mentor protege joint ventures and for joint ventures that uh, wish to perform under socioeconomic set aside contracts have to contain 12 specific provisions. And we're just going to go over three of them in this presentation. So one of the required provisions for all of these joint ventures is a provision that designates the protege or the qualifying partner as the managing venture. So in the case of an 8A or WSB or SDVOSB or HUBZone joint venture, the joint venture agreement must designate the 8A or WSB or SDVOSB or HUBZone business as the managing venture. And it's not enough that the document identify the protege or the qualifying business as the managing venture. Um, they actually have to manage the joint venture, not theoretically on paper, but also in practice. In addition, um, the kind of control that a managing venture has to have, according to the SBA, is really similar to the kind of control that a veteran or a woman or a disadvantaged individual has to have over a WOSB or SDVOSB or an 8A business. In other words, ultimately, the managing venture must have unfettered and exclusive control over the management decisions and day-to-day -day running of the joint venture. And in a 
in the decision by the Office of Hearing Appeals in uh, SOF Associates, the SBA also said that the managing venture's control over the joint venture must be unequivocal. In other words, um, it has to be absolutely clear in the joint venture agreement. So, so in that case, where the joint venture agreement required a supermajority vote for strategic decisions um, and tactical decisions, the SBA concluded that the SDVOSB did not really serve the role of the managing venture. So a second requirement we're going to mention is that an employee of the managing venture, again, either the protege or the qualifying small business, has to be named as the project manager. And the SBA in its decisions has signaled that it expects that an actual individual will be designated by name. And then the last uh, required provision we'll mention is the requirement that if the joint venture is set up as a separate legal entity, like an LLC, the protege or the small business qualifying member must own at least 51% of the joint venture entity. Now all of this is to say that the joint venture agreement has to be scrutinized carefully to ensure compliance with, um, with all of the requirements. So before I, I go on to my conclusions, I just want to talk briefly about one issue that comes up often. And that's uh, the extent of the control that one of the parties is required to have over the joint venture. So for mentor-protege joint ventures, um, it's the protege that has to be the managing venture. Um, and for joint ventures that are eligible to perform under socioeconomic set-asides, it's the 8A or woman-owned business or the service-disabled uh, small business or the hub zone business that has to be the managing venture. And, you know, that can create some tension. You know, when one party is given essentially exclusive control over any significant decisions like budgeting or signing contracts, and this tension can easily flare up when the joint venture is structured uh, as a separate legal entity like an LLC. Um, you know, when a joint venture is an LLC, the operating agreement typically also serves uh, as the joint venture agreement. Um, and companies are used to having provisions that tend to share power among, among owners. Um, so a seemingly innocuous example of this may be in quorum rules that require all parties, I mean, all owners to be present at a meeting in which management issues are going to be decided. But if these provisions can be used by a venture to stall or block decisions by the managing venture, then the joint venture agreement is going to be viewed as invalid. Now, a large business mentor in the mentor protege joint venture or a venture that's not a qualifying venture in a socioeconomic joint venture might be reluctant to hand over so much control. Most companies, unless they're passive inventors, want to have some say in how a business is run and the risks it takes on and how it spends cash and things like that. Um, so when the potential teaming partners reach this kind of, this point of tension, I think it's important for the parties to keep in mind what they're getting into and more importantly, what they're not getting into. Um, and the slide there uh, contains the definition of a joint venture under FAR for size standard purposes. And that definition highlights the transactional nature of the joint venture arrangement that's in, anticipated. And essentially, it's an association to engage in a single specific business venture, but not for continuing or permanent basis. So it is not and should not be intended to last forever. And it's not and should not be intended to carry on several business objectives. You know, in, in other words, it's not your typical business with an unlimited or sustainable horizon. Um, it should only exist to perform under a particular contract or under a limited set of contracts and only for a limited duration. So if a company is not a qualifying venture or if it's a large business mentor, yes, it may be giving up control, but only over a transaction or a limited series of transactions that, would, that it would not in, be engaged in at all were it not for the qualifying protege or the qualifying um, small business. And it's important um, for this 
not to get lost as the parties kind of work through their relationship. So I just want to um, end my presentation with the last couple of thoughts here. Now, the recent changes by the SBA clearly are intended to make joint ventures um, and joint venturing easier, more attractive, and perhaps make it easier for the federal government to meet its small business contracting goals. Um, you know, we see this trend towards consolidation within agencies and between agencies continuing. And for some of these massive procurements, it's very difficult versus for some small businesses to take a prime position because of the scale and complexity of, of even some of the task orders. So as I've mentioned, joint venturing may open up opportunities. But in addition to encouraging small businesses to think more about joint venturing, I also think that the 2016 rule changes, um, that in them the SBA is sending a message that small businesses should think more creatively about the potential uh, joint venture partners. Um, for example, the rules on the All Small Mentor Protege program say that a small business protege can itself be a mentor to another small business as long as the two mentor protege relationships don't conflict. So small businesses really should think creatively about uh, potential joint venture partners. And then secondly, uh, the solicitations are they're not generally marked or set aside for joint ventures. Um, a contracting officer isn't going to say, hey, this contract is ideal for joint ventures. Um, and in theory, any small business set aside can be awarded to a qualifying joint venture. So as with most other prime contractors, um, it's up to the joint venture partners to assess their capabilities and to aggressively pursue um, contracting opportunities. Now this may require some additional coordination among the partners, but it will also require the partners to employ sound marketing strategies. So, um, and this is where I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer Schaus. So thank you for listening to me, and um, Jennifer, let you take over. Mark, uh, I enjoyed your presentation, learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure that the audience did as well. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and just kind of piggybacking off of what Mark uh, was saying, I think the SBA is, uh, as he noted, sending a very loud and clear message uh, in regards to uh, helping small businesses, uh, giving them some extra muscle to um, creatively and aggressively win contracts. So, um, and we can move again to the, uh, the following slide, please. Thank you. So I just wanted to go over um, four kind of uh, marketing strategies for the joint venture, which is, uh, as Mark noted, a, a new business entity. Again, uh, RFPs are not going to be set aside for JVs. It's just how you um, strategically go after and, uh, and attack that RFP or respond to it. Um, so, I, and I think this overall will help uh, the, SP, the agencies bump up their uh, numbers on the SBA scorecard. So, uh, four components here, uh, and I'll try to be brief so we have time for questions, is identify your capabilities as well as your ideal partners, um, ideal being a keyword there, uh, trust but verify, and then executing on that. And we can move to the next slide on the, uh, the capabilities. So first and foremost, you want to know what it is your business does, uh, but more specifically, what your business does well. Uh, I think a big problem that we see with um, small businesses is that they become a, a jack of all, and every time there's an RFP out, whether it's for engineering services or management consulting or um, uh, landscaping, uh, they're responding to everything. Uh, I don't think that's a, a wise uh, strategy. I think pick the one or two things that you do and do them well. Make sure you have the appropriate uh, NAICS codes, your North American Industry uh, Classification System, in your SAM.gov record. Make sure that is current. I mean, these are basics, but it surprises us sometimes when we go into SAM and either can't find a company listed there or uh, their information is out of date. They don't have the right NAICS codes. Um, or incorrect information. 
past performance, you want to make sure that you're bringing something to the table for the joint venture. Um, what have you done in the past? What other government contracts, federal or even state and local, uh, have you worked on providing these specific services uh, that your company provides? Uh, what other joint ventures have you been a part of? Have you been uh, working with any prime contractors? So all of that past performance um, makes you more credible, makes it easier for the partner to trust you. Uh, if you have an agency sweet spot, um, great, because perhaps the partner uh, has a different agency sweet spot. So you should be complementing each other. Maybe you're uh, really embedded with the Air Force and your partner is perhaps with the Navy. Um, so you could find some similarities uh, that you can work on together either to jointly go after perhaps the Army or uh, they can bring your capabilities into opportunities uh, where they've got the relationships uh, and the sweet spot with uh, DOD or I'm sorry um, the Navy and you bring them over to the Air Force. Um, the, la the relationships there, obviously, that's key, um, and you want to build those uh, both deep and wide um, and leverage those and use those. Uh, relationships are key both with your customer as well as with your partners. So if there's a, a company or two or three that you work with well and you can replicate uh, the success there, then that kind of helps with some of the, uh, the trust issues and and kind of knowing who, quote unquote, you're getting into bed with uh, for these opportunities. Uh, the set aside piece I have there, I should have probably put that in parentheses because I always advocate not um, starting out with uh, an introduction saying, hey, we're an 8A, hey, we're a hub zone company, hey, we're Alaska Native uh, American Indian owned, or, or whatever your set aside is. You should really lead uh, first and foremost with your capabilities. Um, the set aside should just be a feather in the cap, but I kept it on there uh, simply because uh, with these new opportunities, there are, uh, as Mark suggested in his concluding slide, creative ways uh, that small businesses can capitalize and take advantage of these new roles. Uh, with that, we'll move to the, uh, the next slide, please. So you obviously want to identify and work with companies who are, are like you uh, in their ethics and in their uh, business acumen uh, and in their uh, past performance. So you want ideal partners. Um, and there are ways that you can uh, go about finding these organizations, whether it's networking events. Um, and if you do meet a company, check them out in SAM. Um, you can go into the uh, SBA ProNet, which is an archive of small businesses, and you can do searches in there by zip code, by uh, if the company has uh, 8A certification, number of employees, women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, all sorts of uh, demographic parameters that you can search. Um, that shouldn't be the way that you find the, uh, the company that you're trying to uh, work with. You should really have a face-to-face -face and a handshake to go with it, but um, sometimes it's good uh, just to use again as a reference. The GSA e-library will direct you to a list of all of the GSA schedules, which are simply contracting vehicles or additional marketing tools. Um, I put this on here simply because the large businesses that are on the GSA schedule have a requirement to parse out a certain percent of business to small businesses. And I have another uh, slide from a different presentation that helps companies navigate uh, how to find companies on the GSA schedule which are in their same industry or complementary industry and then to determine which of those businesses are large businesses. Uh, if you go to any of the GSA schedule uh, pages when you look at the, for those that know the language, the special item number, the SIN number, if you click on the SIN number that will then take you to a, a page uh, that will list all the companies that hold that particular schedule but more specifically that SIN number. The third column from the right, and I should have probably put a visual in here, uh, will tell you um, the company's size. So O will be other, and that means large, and so you would probably want to potentially reach out to that company. Uh, but now with these expanded opportunities, you can also look for uh, uh, veteran-owned. There will be a V next to that company's name, S for small, W for women-owned. 
uh, SDVO for uh, service disabled veteran owned and so forth. So again, those are, are additional tools that you can use to kind of do I'll say your background checks. FPDS is huge, Federal Procurement Data System. It's going to be fpds.gov. Uh, you type in a company name, you type in an agency, you type in uh, basically a Google search, and it's a, a huge publicly available free database that allows uh, the user, uh, you the user, to go on and look at contracts that were awarded to ABC company or, or whoever you're potentially going to be working with. So you can find out, you know, does this company really have direct contracts with the government? Um, are they who they say they are? Uh, the second to the last bullet there, the GovCon organizations, I'm simply referring to associations, um, networking uh, groups for government contractors, whether it's FCA or CCAF or uh, many of the other, NCMA, uh, APMP, um, multiple uh, government contracting organizations where uh, you can find reputable companies. Um, and then the last piece there, I just put chemistry. Uh, just like you would in any personal relationship, uh, this should hold true also for business. You've got to have chemistry. If you have a, a bad feeling in your gut or some hesitation, uh, don't walk down the aisle with this company because the worst thing to do is have somebody tarnish your good reputation. It's going to take that much longer to, um, if they do tarnish your reputation, to kind of clean it up. So make sure that, again, you know who you're, uh, you're working with. And, um, and if it's a good match, then great. It can be replicated for future opportunities. Um, but you really do need to make sure that you do have that chemistry as well. Uh, and we can move to the next slide, please. Trust but verify, a uh, famous quote from uh, Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. Uh, pull a DMB report on the company, uh, the Dun & Bradstreet report. Uh, it'll you know, provide some credit references, uh, some financial information if the company has de decided to disclose that. Ask for some references. You know, who else have you worked with? May I call them and, and ask how their experience was? Um, CPARS is the contractor's uh, performance and uh, rating system, which you won't have access to, but um, I just put that in there as a note uh, because companies will um, typically receive, and your new joint venture will receive CPARS, so the government will be rating you on a variety of factors. I think it's seven total, including timeliness and your cost and your business management plan. Um, the company that you're potentially going to be partnering with uh, is 8A. Uh, make sure that they're not in the, uh, the you know, eighth year or, or ready to expire in the ninth year. Um, so just uh, kind of dot your I's, cross your T's. Go to the company's office, uh, sit down with them, have some coffee, shake some hands, uh, talk to the people in maybe accounting and finance, their proposal writers, who are you going to be working with, what's the culture. Um, and this kind of goes back to the bullet from the last uh, previous slide about chemistry. Just what's the culture there? Is it complementary to how your firm operates? You know, are these uh, super casual people and, and your office is more tidied up with, you know, suits and ties? Um, make sure. And it's fine to have differences. Uh, and sometimes those two um, cultures can complement each other. But just make sure that, uh, that you know what you're getting into. And we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, finally, once you've kind of gone through uh, some of these uh, kind of checks, you then want to execute. Um, using somebody like Mark who understands government contracting, the insides and out, uh, make sure that you do have a, uh, a very sound legal agreement. Can't say it any other way, and it's, uh, it's of the utmost importance. Somebody that understands the rules and how it can benefit you. You want to make sure that you're communicating throughout the process with your partner. Um, a lot of times, even in personal relationships, this is where things can go awry. Uh, communication um, uh, sometimes diminishes. So make sure that you've got regular checks, whether it's a quick conference call or, um, uh, or you know, once a week lunch or, or something along those lines. Make sure that both uh, entities are holding up their end of the uh, agreement. Uh, if they're not or if something happens and you find that you can't uh, perform, 
go back to your attorney, find out what you should uh, should be doing, go back to Mark, uh, get some, some good advice, communicate with your partner um, uh, to keep everything, to keep the ball rolling. Um, make sure that you're complementing each other's capabilities and that you're not stepping on each other's toes too much. Um, I think Mark had also the same bullet point on sharing the risk, which um, is one of, I think one of the great advantages and benefits benefits of joint ventures. Um, you're sharing in the funding as well, and just take responsibility. Uh, this is a new entity that you're forming. It'll have a new DUNS number, um, and you are one of the uh, the main partners in this. So uh, be responsible for what it is you say you are going to do. Uh, maintain your reputation and maintain and ensure that your partner is also uh, maintaining uh, their uh, responsibility. And with that, I think I have a conclusion uh, slide, please. So conclusion, this is uh, really just a marriage with time limits. It's for a specific opportunity or purpose. Um, again, the responsibility that I uh, was just speaking of. You've got more muscle here, so it makes you more attractive to the government as the risk is shared. You've got additional um, capabilities um, and the set-aside bonus, um, as Mark uh, discussed, that both parties don't need to be hub zones. So again, be creative with that. Um, and you've got uh, increased potential and footprint. Again, in that example, maybe you're uh, pretty well situated and embedded in the Air Force and the partner is uh, with the Navy. Well, great. Uh, use that to your advantage. Um, making sure that you're not um, violating any kind of uh, non-compete or any other issues that uh, that might, legal issues that might come up in this. And I think that's it for my slides unless there's one last one. Q&A. I think that's it. And Mark, I'll give the Jennifer, microphone back so to you. Much. Thank you again for the opportunity. Jennifer, so awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, thanks for all that really useful information on marketing strategies. So at this point, uh, we're going to take uh, a few questions that have been submitted to us during the presentations. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to send them along by writing them down at the bottom of your screen. And again, um, if you have a question uh, for a particular presenter, um, feel free to send um, that along. Um, now if we run out of time or if you have questions after the webinar is over, uh, we're going to be providing our contact information. Um, and, um, and let me go ahead and, and do that now. Um, so feel free to email us any questions if they come up, and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, so let me go ahead and start here. Um, So uh, the first question I have, well, I have quite a few. So um, first uh, is, can a mentor-protege joint venture include other parties besides the mentor and protege? Um, no, uh, the rules anticipate that the mentor-protege joint ventures will include two parties, uh, only the mentor and the protege. So uh, if you want to collaborate with a third party, you would need to create a third joint venture. Uh, but remember, um, when you do that, if the affiliation rules will apply unless that joint venture falls within one of the other three categories. Um, and the only one really left is the small business, small business joint venture category. Um, so, um, so there's that. Let's see. Let me see here. And then Jennifer, I think there's one for you. Hold on a sec. Uh, where can, when, uh, when and should I begin marketing my joint venture? Thank you for the uh, the question. Um, I would wait until the the entity is formed that uh, both parties have signed off uh, on the the legal uh, document and everything has been established through your. Um, government contracts attorney, uh, hopefully Mark Amadeo. Um, so I wouldn't start uh, marking it in advance because it doesn't exist yet, so you wouldn't want to be caught with any legal implications. Um, 
and I don't know, Mark, if you have anything uh, to add to that, but um, those are just my candid thoughts. No, I mean, I think the, the sooner the better. I think um, the sooner the parties get together and begin to kind of like, um, I think begin the sooner they begin to target the kind of uh, solicitation that they're going to go after, the better, um, so that they can kind of prepare all of the teaming arrangements and all the, the kind of joint venture agreements, get all of that in place long before um, a solicitation hits the wire. So um, the sooner the better. Um, let's see. Um, with the 3-2 rule, are there restrictions on the type of contract that the joint venture can pursue? No, there are not. Uh, you know, um, the, um, the joint venture can pursue any kind of contract um, um, within that kind of joint venture structure. So um, it, it's it's a limitation on the number of contracts, not the type of contracts. Um, so that's that. And then I have a, a question, another question for you, Jennifer. Should I create a new capability statement and website for the joint venture? I don't know that you would necessarily need a new website. Um, you could perhaps list it on your current existing website. Uh, capability statement, um, I don't see why not. I think um, having some sort of uh, handout or something that demonstrates the, um, the added uh, muscle and the, the bonus of having the, the partner there with you, whatever it is they're bringing to the table, their makes codes that you don't have or um, uh, some past performance that could be highlighted, I think, is certainly beneficial. So, yeah, I think a, a marketing handout, whether it's a capability statement or uh, something along those lines, certainly cannot help, can, cannot hurt. Thanks. Okay. Um, so another question, I think th there are several questions that kind of overlap. So one is, uh, does the SBA have to approve all joint venture agreements? Um, so, no, the SBA does not have to approve all of them, uh, but keep in mind, um, 8A contracts have a special place in the SBA's heart, so any joint venture to perform an 8A contract will first have to have the joint venture agreement approved by the SBA before the 8A contract is awarded. Now, for a joint venture that performs under other socioeconomic set-asides like, um, or for, the, or for a, a mentor-protege joint venture, one thing to keep in mind um, is that although the SBA does not have to approve the actual joint venture agreement, the protege or the qualifying small business will still have to submit a certification certifying that the joint venture agreement meets all applicable requirements. Let me see, I think there's one more for you, Jennifer. Um, there's a couple more. How do I market myself as someone who wants to partner and form a joint venture? Um, I think the joint venture, as we said, is really just a, a way to uh, respond to a an, an specific project, opportunity, RFP, whatever that is. Um, so whether you want to market yourself as open to joint ventures or mentor-protege or teaming partner or uh, any of the other, uh, as a subcontractor, whatever it is, your, your main goal really is that you want to sell to the government you want to be a government contractor. So um, I'll just kind of answer that broadly as, you know, how do you market yourself to the government? Um, and I think one of my slides kind of covered, you know, making sure that you just have some of the basics. Uh, you'd be surprised you go to somebody's website, they don't have a, a capability statement that's current that could be downloaded. Um, you go to SAM and their information is incorrect, they don't have the right NICS codes. Somebody hands you their business card and I always advocate having uh, some information on the back of your card, your NICS codes, uh, any contract vehicles that you may have, uh, any set-aside designations that you have, and so forth. Um, making it easy for other companies, whether it's another small business or perhaps a large business, meaning a, a prime contractor, and 
uh, some of the usual suspects that everybody wants to target, whether it's the Lockheed's, the Raytheon, CSC, and so forth. Um, you know, how do you end up working with them? Well, you can go onto their website and register as a vendor, uh, which I think is wise and smart to do, particularly before you decide to reach out to them. Uh, do some homework on FPDS to find out what agencies these potential partners are working in and what are you bringing to the table? Because if you think of the, uh, the statistics, you know, there's going to be thousands of small businesses that want to do exactly what you do. So what's your value add and, and what sets you aside? And a lot of it does just kind of come down to grit. Um, working hard day in, day out, going to the networking events, shaking the hands, uh, going to the Ozdevu events, um, and so forth. So um, long answer to a short question. Sorry. No, thanks, Jennifer. Um, the, uh, we have a few more questions. Um, can I use the same joint venture for different purposes? In other words, can I use one joint venture for WOSB contracts, and then if I get HubZone certified or 8A certified, can I use the same joint venture for those contracts? Um, you can, but uh, there are some uh, additional considerations you have to keep in mind. First, for the 8A, for 8A joint ventures, um, an 8A company needs to first get approval even before it enters into a joint venture. Um, so you would first need to alert the SBA that you have an intent to use joint ventures for 8A contracts and get their approval. Then you would then, after getting their approval, would then have to amend your joint venture agreement uh, to add the 8A contract purposes. And then again, you would need to have the amended joint venture agreement approved by the, S by the SBA before an 8A contract is awarded. So you've got to have kind of several steps before you can actually use an existing joint venture um, in an 8A contract. So the other thing that you have to consider is the limits on contract awards for the affiliation exception to apply. Now, each joint venture can only be awarded three contracts over a two-year period. Now, if collectively your joint venture will remain small, this isn't going to be an issue. But if in the aggregate um, it will exceed the small business size standard, um, that's your typical small business size standard, um, then it will be an issue. So parties may want to instead considering entering into separate joint ventures for 8A contracts or for WSB contracts or for hub zone contracts. Um, and, and that's permissible. You can enter into um, you know, uh, different joint ventures with the same parties. Um, let's see, we have a few more questions. Uh, so in a small or small socioeconomic category that's not part of a mentor protege, does the joint venture have to do any filing with the SBA to prove non-association status? Nope. Uh, the only filing um, that has to be submitted is, again, um, with the socioeconomic um, joint ventures and the all small mentor protege joint ventures, um, the the you know like I said the the, the protege or the qualifying socioeconomic um, partner is going to have to submit a certification that it meets the joint venture agreement uh, requirements. Um, but there is no other filing uh, with the SBA. Um, another one is please. Uh, reiterate the restrictions on employees for joint ventures, and then does the joint venture entity have to be SDVOSB certified by the VA? Um, so if it, and that's a good question, I may have to follow up, but certainly the restriction on employees for joint ventures, again, if you create a separate um, legal entity, right, um, if you create an LLC, um, the LLC or that separate entity can't hire its own employees. All of the work has to be done through the joint venture partners and employees of the joint venture partners, um, not, not through employees of, um, of the joint venture entity. Um, and then, 
So does the joint venture entity have to be SDVOSB certified by the VA? No, it, it does not have to be certified by the SD by the VA. Um, because remember, certification by the VA is for a VA contract. So, uh, you know, if there is an SDVOSB um, set aside uh, for by procurements for other agencies, you don't need that um, that certification. Um, so let's see now. The other question is: With the three-two rule, are there restrictions on the type of contract that the G, that the joint venture can pursue? In other words, can the joint venture pursue multi-year? BPA, um, would the BPA count as one of the three? Um, yes, um, it would count as one of the three, and there is no, um, there's no, I think I mentioned that, there's no restriction on the type of contracts that the joint venture can pursue. Um, another question is, if you form a joint venture, one small and one small hub zone, and you incorporate, um, get Fed ID done, SAMS, do we have any state filing requirements? Um, I would imagine you do. Um, so in Virginia, you probably, if you're going to incorporate and, and do business in Virginia, you have to obviously um, comply with the Virginia corporation rules. Um, that doesn't have any implication on um, any filing requirements with, with, the, uh, with the SBA, though. So those filing requirements would be separate, and there's no additional uh, requirement uh, that's going to be imposed on you for purposes of filing with the SBA if you, you know, file or incorporate in Virginia and do anything else in, in, in any other jurisdiction. And then um, I think that's it. Don't have any more questions. I hope we've answered them all. If, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to send them. Uh, again, um, if you have questions after the, the presentation, um, you know, we've got our contact information up there, so feel free to, um, to, to contact us after the presentation is over. So um, I think that's it. Uh, Jennifer, unless you have any last-minute thoughts or questions or comments? No, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody uh, who joined us today. I think we had over 100 people. Thank you to Mark for the opportunity to co-present with you. Um, our website has recently been updated, and so when Mark sends over the recording for this, I'll, uh, I'll put that on our website under the uh, webinar section. And um, yeah, I, uh, I learned a lot from you, Mark, and um, enjoyed uh, presenting with you. So thank you again. Uh, great. Thanks. Uh, so before we conclude the webinar, I just want to thank um, everyone for attending. Again, we're going to make the presentation available um, uh, as well as the recording uh, available, and I'm going to go ahead and, and change the slide here. We're going to um, make it available at that um, site there, um, at that link up there. Um, everyone will also get an email with with this information, um, but you'll also get an email with the um, the firm's updated uh, white paper on joint ventures. And also look out for uh, government contracting webinars in the near future. Uh, we're planning one that. Uh, goes over far flow down clauses. Um, so look out for that, uh, that information uh, in the future. I also want to give a special thanks to Jennifer for her um, informative presentation on marketing uh, to the federal government. Um, Jennifer and her team are an invaluable resource for government contractors that are looking to market uh, their goods and services in the federal government marketplace. Um, and Jennifer and I have tag teamed on a few other uh, webinars. So I invite, uh, invite folks to go to her website or to go to my website to check them out. So, so thanks again, Jennifer, for spending your time with us and sharing your expertise. Um, and that's it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, so long until next time.